It is hot. It's big. And violent. Pro wrestling is a raging phenomenon and a booming financial success. The carefully choreographed mayhem in the ring is matched by a frenzy in the marketplace. An array of merchandise, all built on the macho heroes who kick butt and worse in the ring. All of this, a far cry from wrestling's ancestral roots as an ancient sport, and nearly as far from its birth in the early days of television, with heroes in action quaint by comparison. Today's wrestling heroes are everywhere. Stone Cold Steve Austin's appearance propelled Nash Bridges to its highest rating of the season on CBS. These December covers boosted TV guide sales by a half million issues in one week. That success led the magazine last week to repeat the strategy. Pro wrestling figures are guest stars and pinups and politicians and salesmen. Step into a Slim Jim. And traditional athletes are climbing into pro wrestling's ring. Carl Malone, Reggie White, Dennis Rodman, Kevin Green, they've all had their turn. Wrestling's impact crosses over to other playing fields. And while there is no pretense, these ballets of the turnbuckle are anything but theater. I'm the Robert De Niro of wrestling. There is an undeniable athletic quality to them. Kind of like Larry Bird in type. But this performance art of sport has a dark side and many questions. Do you think steroids are still found in wrestling locker rooms? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, I do. Do a disproportionate number of pro wrestlers die well before their time? It is, you know, a time bomb that was bound to go off and explode on someone, and unfortunately, that was my husband. And this steady diet of violence and sex. What is it doing to the kids who watch? It's a nationwide monster. It's got to be stopped. Damn it, it is America. Go live in your world. Don't like us. Click us off. Why pro wrestling on Outside the Lines? Yes, we know these matches are scripted drama, sports entertainment. But they have the veneer of athletics, and the world inside these ropes is largely divided between the WWF, World Wrestling Federation, and WCW, World Championship Wrestling. Rival groups who flaunt their mutual disdain. But this business has serious questions, some involving violence and sexually explicit content. We will investigate that along with other topics tonight, and for that reason, parents should consider whether children should watch this hour. But for a wrestling industry founded on bombast, the ultimate rule is anything to get them into the tent. And millions of fans are pouring in. They are electric in Cincinnati. And we're Cincinnati's first star center is a broiling frenzy of anticipation and adrenaline. On a Monday night, nearly 20,000 people are here to witness a spectacle. At the center of this maelstrom, Bill Goldberg. He and Ric Flair will tag team against Hollywood Hogan and Kevin Nash. But right now, Goldberg's name fills the air. He will be introduced last. I psych myself up. I go through moves. I go through scenarios. You know, warm up a little bit. Stay focused straight ahead. Pour some water on my head and I'm ready to go. This wrestling superstar is impossible to miss. Star Grand Marshal of the Cracker Barrel 500. Cracking wise with Jay Leno. Schmoozing with Regis and Kathy Lee. Testifying for animal rights on Capitol Hill. Pitching a new game for the Illinois Lottery. You have to take advantage of the moment. And if it means spreading yourself thin, so be it. Because when people are knocking down your door, you got to open it. You can't just shut it in their face. Wrestling fans are beating down the door. During the commercially critical February rating sweeps, Pro Wrestling registered 21 of the top 25 cable programs. Audiences rich in the coveted demographic of young men. Each week, 40 million Americans watch some variation of this. Small wonder this entire industry now boasts annual estimated revenues over $1 billion. We deliver. We don't uh, 
sell anybody short, whether it's a three-hour program or a three-hour pay-per-view for 59 bucks or 39 bucks. We don't knock somebody out in 20 seconds. You get three hours of entertainment. With larger-than-life characters rich in charisma, Goldberg, Stone Cold Steve Austin, Hollywood Hogan, The Undertaker, Kevin Big Sexy Nash, The Rock, Sting, Mankind, Brett Hitman Hart, each flaunting a unique personality to drive a wedge through wrestling's rabid audience. Love him or hate him, cheer for his victory or scream for his destruction. If we can get them all to chant the same thing in unison against this person or for this guy or incite a certain reaction, that's exactly what we're after. And that's what keeps the people coming back. They're loud, they're proud, they're noisy, they're, they're, they're just... They're outrageous, and people like that form of entertainment. We bust our butts because we love to entertain our audience. It is in us, and it has to get out. And when you have an appreciative audience like we do, they dictate to us, not the other way around. We listen to them. So it's no accident wrestling's explosion in profits and popularity mirrors the disappearance from the ring of the classic good guy. No longer does good fight evil. Now it's bad guys against worse. Stone Cold Steve Austin was a flop as stunning Steve Austin. Here's exhibit A in how wrestling's heroic image has devolved. Hulk Hogan in the 80s preached virtue to kids. Hulkamania became an epidemic, a profit center for the WWF. But today, he is Hollywood Hogan, wrestling for the rival WCW, and he's a bad guy. Once uh, Hulk Hogan said the training, the prayers, and the vitamins, and all you kids, I did it for the money. You don't know one person in life that goes around in your world saying, have you taken your vitamins, have you said your prayers, and things of that nature. That's bull crap. You know, it was then, but people bought it then. Fine. They bought that then, they're not buying it now. So you know what? We're not selling it now. Backstage in Cincinnati, Goldberg chats with one of the hottest athletes of the moment, Wally Zerbiak from Miami of Ohio. The night after leading his school to the NCAA Sweet 16, Zerbiak is a fan. I respect the athletes out there because they're really true athletes. And some of the stuff that they do is uh, unmatchable, uh, you know, e even in a lot of sports. So it's something I enjoy watching for entertainment. I think we out-cartoon the cartoons. We out-talk the talk shows. I think we out-action the action adventures. I see wrestling as kind of a 90s version of a morality play. Uh, are we any different from Hamlet? We're the wily coyotes of, uh, of modern day. We get hit with chairs and hit with this and that. Get up and here we come again. I think what we do uh, definitely gives the people someone to kind of latch on to and live vicariously through. I'd have to say it's the 90s version of a very physical male soap opera, and I'm one of the leading characters. A stage where every man must play a part. Those words are from Shakespeare. This stage belongs to wrestling great Killer Kowalski. This is his ring where aspiring pro wrestlers learn the mechanics of this sweaty soap opera. But as Greg Garber reports, the illusion of wrestling is more than that. There is plot, character, and conflict. As Shakespeare wrote, I should but teach him how to tell my story. Do you smell what the rock is cooking? This man's name isn't really The Rock, but his character and his actions are carved in stone long before he steps in the ring. Well, we have writers, and, um, you know, once they, they kind of sit down and, and they write for the upcoming show, and I'd say, you know, within the next month on what they'd like to do, and, and the good thing about it is the writers we do have are, are really in tune with The Rock. It's just smell that The Rock is cooking! What is The Rock going to be cooking? Where will the New World Order's next double cross come from? Who wears the belt? These are the decisions made by the creative think tanks in wrestling. There's the brainstorming uh, that goes on for the first couple hours of a meeting, and then basically you've got to get down to nuts and bolts, and you've got to get something down, whether you want to call it in our business a script or what you're going to do, but basically there comes a time when the brainstorming has to stop, and bam, you know, you've got to put out a TV show, and it's the same for writers, I, I, I would imagine, on anything. There's an ongoing demand by the wrestling fans to make the storylines, you know, beyond their imagination all the time. You know, like, amaze me with where it's going to go next. It's kind of changed now where two guys in a pair of trunks 
uh, exchanging holds for 20 minutes isn't going to rivet a viewer's attention. In this day and age, in 1999, the storylines are the one and only most important thing. The storylines are borrowed from classic themes, as is the television production, old-fashioned serial with weekly cliffhanger endings. The way the end of the shows are, the raw and the nitro, I mean, you want to play to the very, the crescendo, if that's the word, at the end, it's, it's right there, and you want to, boom, and then you drop it off right there, and then it's, you know, tune in next week and see what's going on. My famous line is, fans, we're out of time, we got to go. We're out of time, we're going to see you Thursday night, look at this! From the big arena shows of the WWF and the WCW to the smaller venues of regional wrestling, the creative concepts are the same. This is the National Wrestling Alliance of New England. He broke my arm. He broke my arm. Joe Gulla and his twin brother Frank are the tag team champions, House of Pain. And Joe is actually in pain. A few weeks earlier, he tore cartilage in his right shoulder, a real injury that needs real surgery and real recovery time. And that's a real problem for promoter Tony Rumble. A 15-year wrestling veteran, Rumble controls all the angles or storylines for the NWA New England. In early March, Rumble and his associates devise a scenario to explain the surgery, a story involving the House of Pain and their rival, Archangels, to be played out at a show in Southbridge, Massachusetts. House of Pain. Archangels. Maybe we could we could screw them over on the way to the ring. Let's get them to suck a Joe Guller out. He leaves and then they can attack him. Ten days later in Southbridge, Gullah is ready to videotape his downfall for use on an upcoming NWA TV show. Gullah will be approached by the Archangel's manager, GQ John Rodea. He'll distract Gullah with a false proposition so his team can attack. Joe Gullah, how you doing? John Rodea. I'm going to talk to you for a minute, man. Forget the Archangels. I want to manage the House of Pain, Joe. Let me tell you something. Don't even think that you have one. Uh, 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 he shut me up, Rodeo. You get me when I get you, Rodeo, brother. Moments later, the teams reassemble to discuss what are called spots, specific points of action in the match they are about to have. The run-through helps the finished product look more realistic. Tag, throw him off the ropes. He's gonna come off. We're gonna body press him. Draw. I'm thinking about working the shoulder. That's it. Put the boots to him. Throw a punch. You can take me down. And then I'll wrap my my legs around it. Submission. Oh my god. I gotta worry about permanent damage. Oh, you can hear the screaming at ringside that he, he has submitted, he's tapping out, it's over, it's over. The, the match goes off his plan. The House of Pain lost their title belts. Joe Gullah's surgery has now been written into his wrestling storyline, which is ripe for a sequel or two. We'll be back. We'll be back one day, Angels. And let me tell you, you messed with the wrong person. The winners, the losers, the champs and the chumps. The storylines are all created at the booking meetings that go on in every wrestling company. Angles on who's the good baby face, who's the evil heel, how to get crowd support or heat for a wrestler to get him over, more popular with the audience. Watching you guys talk this through and figure this thing out, sort of draw it all up, it looks like an awful lot of fun. It is fun. It's creative. It's like toy soldiers. It's similar to that. It's like playing. It's just like playing with your GI Joes. Is that what you're talking about? Like when you were a kid. Only we've got live athletes to uh, to uh, play with. Rumble does more than just create characters. He is one. The Boston Bad Boy. A month earlier, Rumble lost a TV match to Trooper Gilmore. There will be a rematch in South Korea. Trooper Gilmore won. He defeated Tony Rumble. Speaking as a trooper. After TV last time, after I, after, uh, I put him over, mm -hmm. I'm going to get my heat back on him. I'm just going to kick his ass as much as possible. Trooper Gilmore! Shortly before the show, Trooper Gilmore gets the bad news. Me and you in the second match? Okay. okay. I'm just going to beat the shit out of you. The Boston bad boy is extra bad in the ring. His wrestling crony, the Brotherhood, help out with a classic wrestling staple, the folding chair. Ah! 
While the start and finish of a match are predetermined by the bookers, the responsibility for the middle and the illusion of violence falls squarely on the wrestlers and their communication in the ring. A basic spot from here is either you can pull a guy into a headlock. Okay. From here, a headlock, you can do lots of things. This is a good place to talk. See where my hands are? I covered his mouth. He can say whatever he wants to say. I can shut it down and say, no, I don't want to do that, or yes, I want to do that. Calling spots on the fly is an ad-lib performance. For example, Trooper Gilmore knew Tony Rumble was going to destroy him, but he didn't know exactly how. Take a big close on it, buddy. Big close. Elbow around it. Elbow. Oh, big foot. Boston Crab. Roll to your left, baby. It's time for the big finish at the Southbridge Show. And finishes don't get much bigger than 450-pound King Kong Bundy. Bundy still has star power and headlines around the country. The booking scenario for this one was pretty simple. Bundy will just feed him some meat, let him chew him up, a couple of uh, five-count type of uh, things. There he is right here. There's a lot of... Oh! Five. That's the legend. You happy? Am well, I happy? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm happy as long as, as long as all the kids are happy and you can see the faces of these kids. They had a blast. Ahead tonight, many of those kids, millions nationwide, watch televised wrestling rich in violence, profanity, and sex. Suck it! Suck it! What is wrestling's impact on children? Outside the Lines, Pro Wrestling's Hold on America is presented by AT&T. It's all within your reach. Pro Wrestling is founded on muscle and might. In the past, that's meant steroids. Ahead, we'll see if anything has changed, whether the industry is clean, and which city wrestling apparently goes out of its way to avoid. A number of pro wrestlers do have traditional athletic backgrounds. We'll consider the ongoing debate. Are pro wrestlers athletes? The risks that our guys take night in, night out, and the way that they don't kill themselves, that, that's athletic. Millions of children watch this entertainment that is steeped in violence, profanity, and sex. Next, we'll see if those images and language have an impact on kids. true thing about professional wrestling, kids love it. They're a target audience. Now, we'd like to repeat our parental warning because of the material in our next report. What is the message that kids get from pro wrestling? WCW is criticized for its violence and gang imagery, but they claim to draw the line at profanity and explicit sex. The WWF TV Guide noted that its corporate logo could well be the upraised middle finger. Their controversial Super Bowl commercial spooked the criticism of its violence and sex while, of course, showing both. Not all of this is intended for kids, but they do see it. And Mark Schwartz reports that is a growing concern. Oh my gosh! They simulate sex. Whoa! They flash flesh. Oh my God! They flip the bird. Oh my! They draw blood. Ah. Then drink it. And they throw in an occasional human sacrifice. These are signs of the times. Oh, let's get ready to suck it! <laughs> suck it! Suck it! Thirteen-year-old Corey Fear can't get enough WWF attitude. This is regular after-school activity in his Southern California backyard. It may not have all the flash and trash of a live event, but it has enough plywood and sheet metal to maintain the attitude. Suck it! Corey has been suspended from school three times as a result of aggressive behavior, including inappropriate sexual gestures and language. Most recently, after he pointed toward his crotch and yelled, suck it, at a female classmate. So when you say suck it, 
What are you telling somebody? It's just a gesture. I mean, it's not like I'm, I'm not saying, get your head down there and suck it. He's not the only one out there. His friends, people you see, you know, you hear them in the stores, uh, everywhere you go. So it's uh, not just him singling out doing it. So we got a generation of kids yelling, suck it. Yeah. What did you get in trouble for? What were you doing? Suck it. What is that? My private part. Thaddeus Simmons goes to kindergarten near Memphis, Tennessee. He was punished for using WWF language. Four sixth graders at the same school were suspended for acting out violent scenes they saw performed by WWF wrestlers. When I ask them, where do you pick this up? And they say, oh, Miss Allen, they do it on the, the wrestling program. Don't you watch the wrestling? How you doing, Dr. Brian O'Connell, an elementary school principal near Buffalo, New York, was so outraged about students using sexual gestures and vulgar language that he attributes to the WWF, he alerted parents that the crass and violent behavior would no longer be tolerated. Aren't these guys making too much of this? Isn't this just like a comic book or a cartoon? No, because I'm, I'm petrified that someday the school's going to call me during recess and say some other child put my kid in a headlock and broke his neck. It's a monster, is really what it is. It's a nationwide monster. It's got to be stopped. The principal is entitled to his opinion. I'm entitled to mine. WWF chairman Vince McMahon, who created Raw is War, cable TV's top-rated series, uses words like conservative and tame to describe his programming, which until February was rated TVPG. Parental guidance suggested. McMahon felt the change to the slightly more cautionary TV-14 was appropriate, especially given the explicit storylines most often seen after 10 o'clock Monday nights. How bad is it? How bad can it be? My God, they say a few colorful words, you know, a few expletives. Oh my God, they flip the finger. How bad is it compared to everything else that's out there on television today? When did you last watch, you know, afternoon soap opera? Oh my God! Compared to afternoon soap opera, we're, we're Sunday school teachers. If Vince McMahon wants to argue that, um, you know, well, why are you beating up on me? And this isn't soap opera. You know, soap operas are a problem, and uh, you know, ten o'clock program is a problem. Well, kids aren't coming to school discussing NYPD Blue, and they're not coming to school talking about the latest storyline of General Hospital and Guiding Light. Last I looked, uh, no one's guts were spilling out, having been shot you know, on a WWF set or knifed or anything like that, there is no murder. There is no portrayal of murder. But there has been this. And all we can speculate is that Client High got the job done. I actually think when Val Venus was castrated, it was a, a low point for the show. And I think that the, uh, I think the viewers uh, made their feelings known. Oh my God, they do castration. No. You didn't see castration. You didn't see a damn thing. Mmm. Mmm. That's so good. Oh. Yeah. And there has been portrayal of oral sex by a transvestite oh who dupes gosh. a character known as sexual oh. chocolate. Yeah. You're right up there for me. Yeah, baby. Oh, oh we Jesus! What's you wrong, got a baby? penis? What's wrong, baby? They didn't tell oh. me. That's why they call it Sammy, baby. It's going to be okay, honey. It's going to be okay. I'm sorry. I, I find that comedic. I see really... A nine-year-old boy watching without parental supervision really did not see it as comedy with, at all. As in, sometimes they actually make a girl into a man, a, a man into a girl, and then, and then they switch that around with a man, and then they sort of mate together and then that that is where that is really sick parts and that's when my dad saw it and then he told me to never watch it again was that appropriate for a nine-year-old to see i don't think so you say no i don't think so no way no i don't think so even though again it wasn't really explicit as compared to some of the other stuff on television mcmahon never said his product was for everyone what he did say is that parents should be responsible for monitoring what their children watch we wholeheartedly would want parents and everyone to be able to exercise their freedom of choice. Click. That's not for me. Yes, I control what my children are watching. 
but I can't control what happens in school. Other parents let their children watch this stuff. They turn around, tell my son. I walk down a toy aisle in our department store, and it's plastered all over the place. Action figures, dolls. These aren't being uh, bought by and enjoyed by adults. These are for eight-year-olds, ten-year-olds. Perhaps no one has been more critical of McMahon than New York Post and TV Guide columnist Bill Mushnick. T-shirts with vulgar expressions written on them. These are being worn and purchased by kids or by adults for kids. The WWF would cease to exist without children. Raw is War, the WWF program with the most mature content, is seen Mondays in primetime, 9 to 11 p.m. Eastern on USA Network. McMahon argues that 70% of that audience is at least 18. He invites younger viewers to tune into the WWF's weekend morning shows. However, those shows feature excerpts from primetime and encourage viewers to watch Monday night. Over the last year, the 2 to 17 year old audience for Raw is War has more than doubled. Ads targeting this younger demographic, selling video games, toys, even talking watches are seen regularly on Monday night. We market to children, we'll market to that 15%. We'll market to the 15%, you know, which is the teenage compliment. Uh, we'll market to the other 70%, you know, which are 18 and above. McMahon insists his audience gets it, that his wrestlers are in fact actors. And he doesn't buy the argument that his younger viewers can't distinguish fiction from reality. Let's give the younger compliment a little bit of credit in terms of what's real and what, what is it. Of course they know that we're entertainers. I think it's real. Why? Because it's all blood and stuff. They think it's real. You have a 10-year-old and a 7-year-old. Yes, I do. They think Two it's boys. real? They think it's real. We've told them that it's all fake. And they'll come right out and they'll say, well, not all of it's fake. Damn it, it is America. Go live in your world. Don't like us. Click us off. Don't watch us. McMahon's not worried about losing viewers. He has clearly tapped a powerful cultural nerve. He says he's simply listening to his audience. The public, by the way, more than anything else, votes with their wallet, with their pocketbook. And thus far, they wholeheartedly not only accept, but embrace what we're giving them. But the business embraced by the public continues to be dogged by the image of steroid abuse. Later, we'll investigate whether pro wrestling has been cleaned up at all. Next, we'll see how much athletic skill is actually needed to star in the theater of pro wrestling. may be high camp theater, but a number of wrestling stars did have traditional athletic careers. Bill Goldberg first made his name as a defensive tackle at the University of Georgia and then the Atlanta Falcons. Before Kevin Nash was big sexy, he was the Tennessee Volunteers center. The macho man came from baseball. Randy Savage was a minor league catcher for the Reds, Cardinals, and White Sox. And Dwayne Johnson, the Rock, played defensive tackle for the Miami Hurricanes. But does that qualify pro wrestlers as athletes? We asked a future Hall of Famer who once stepped through the ropes himself. You see the guys take the bumps and the falls that they take. It's no doubt in my mind they're a great athlete. And they bring to their profession not just traditional athletic skills, speed, agility, and strength, but the ability to play a part, to sell their role, and do so like a Hollywood stuntman. It's a very physical sport. It's, enter it's entertainment at its best, but at the same time, uh, sometimes you're expected to jump out of the grandstands into a Dixie cup, you know, without water. The risks that our guys take night in, night out, and the way that they don't kill themselves, that, that's athletic. All pro wrestlers know pain, but even they marvel at Mick Foley's ability to play hurt. Foley is a legend for his pain threshold, which he says surpasses that shown in one of sports' epic moments. I grew up uh, with a memory of Willis Reed 1970 championships limping onto the court as a portrait in courage and i can honestly say in all seriousness that the things i've seen and the things i've done would put willis reed to shame as far as playing with pain i defy any other athlete to play with the type of injuries that that we've had 
This can be a painful and violent existence. Ahead, we'll see if the lifestyle in and around the ring leads to premature deaths for an uncommon number of pro wrestlers. And next, whether pro wrestling is serious about ridding itself of steroids. Wayne Coleman wrestled as superstar Billy Graham. His ring career brought fame in the 70s and many health complications ever since. He recently underwent a ninth hip replacement surgery. He suffers from near constant pain. Pain, he told ESPN five years ago, that stems from his abuse of steroids. If I had any way to redo it, I would have never touched a steroid. I have to live the rest of my life now in pain and suffering and a lot of it. The complications from steroid abuse are by now familiar. Everything from liver to reproductive to heart problems. WWF Chairman Vince McMahon was acquitted four years ago of federal steroid trafficking charges. In pro wrestling, where bigger is always better, how prevalent is steroid use today? Jeremy Schapp tells us there are profound doubts this industry is serious about policing the illegal use of these drugs. Portland, Oregon is the 23rd largest television market in the United States. It's the only market in the top 34 that neither World Championship Wrestling nor the World Wrestling Federation has visited in the last six years. And quite frankly, we would love to play Portland, Oregon. We would love to. It's a wonderful market. A wonderful market in the state with the nation's most stringent drug testing procedures for pro wrestling. Other states have, have, have testing procedures and so forth that, that we have to abide by. Uh, we don't have a problem with any of it. It's just that Oregon is so different than all the rest of them. In April of last year, McMahon's rival organization, WCW, considered staging a show in Portland, according to the recently retired director of the Oregon Boxing and Wrestling Commission. He told ESPN that 12 days after his office forwarded its drug testing laws to WCW, WCW said it would not come to Oregon. Why did you pull out? I have no idea. Aren't you in charge? Out of everything. <laughs> I, can't, I, I, can't, I can't tell you, you know, no why that, no, I really don't remember. An official with the Rose Garden in Portland told ESPN that the WCW and WWF have made clear their displeasure over the Oregon drug testing laws for pro wrestling. Rose Garden officials are backing a proposed amendment to relax those rules. The state Senate is expected to decide on that amendment by July. Anyone who followed pro wrestling in the 1970s, 80s, and early 90s remembers wrestling's history of admitted steroid abuse. Its two most visible figures, Hulk Hogan and Vince McMahon, both testified in a federal trial that they'd used steroids when they were legal. Back then, Hogan and McMahon were far from alone. When I first joined the WWF, I, I, I experimented with steroids, I think, as much as it was almost a... Um, he almost had to. Using steroids for non-medical reasons became illegal in 1991. That year, a doctor assigned to WWF shows in Pennsylvania was convicted of distributing steroids to wrestlers. McMahon promised to clean up the WWF, saying the Federation's steroid abuse policy would be, quote, the gold standard. But the WWF's own wrestlers admit that that has now changed. There was a time when it was the most stringent testing of any sport or, uh, or performance. Now they tend to, to test people that they believe may have a problem. McMahon says the WWF tests for steroids when there's reasonable cause. His definition of reasonable cause? If I see someone with a syringe hanging around, you know, whatever the case may be, I think that's reasonable cause. We establish the same procedures as anyone else that does any type of drug testing. By the way, is there steroid testing in, the, in baseball? I don't think so. Is baseball sport? Son of a gun. Oh, professional hockey? There, there's got to be. Stero oh, I guess not. Major League Baseball and the NHL don't test for steroids, but the NBA and NFL do. WCW standard contract also includes an anti-drug clause. It prohibits the use of illegal drugs and steroids. Gosh. Well, certainly we test for steroids because that's the thing that we're, you know, this is more of, a, of a, a public relations initiative on our part because we know the sensitivity that's out there. When you say it's more of a public relations initiative, do you mean that you're not 
as serious about this as no, you I'm have very believe. No, I'm very serious about it. I mean, but we're also not dumb. We know that if one of our guys, if one of our wrestlers, has been abusing drugs, has been abusing steroids, they can have a horribly negative effect not only on the individual, but certainly on this company. One thing drug testing cannot be is a PR event. Dr. Gary Wadler is a leading authority on steroids and their often debilitating effects on the human body. He was called by the government as an expert witness in the two major wrestling steroid trials, including McMahon's in 1994. So the question would be, what is your program, and can we be assured it's being implemented? And then, depending on the results, actions are being taken. According to the WCW's contract, steroids are banned but some wrestlers still use them. I never said there wasn't abuse. I would never said there wasn't use. There have been people who have used steroids. There have been people who have been found on a regular basis to have been using steroids vis-a-vis -vis our drug testing policy. And they are counseled accordingly and they have adhered to our policy. So yes, it does exist. That's why we continue to test for it. How many wrestlers do you have under contract? Probably in the neighborhood of about 80, 90. How many have tested positive for steroids? I couldn't tell you that. I don't know if the top approximation. Of my head. I, I wouldn't. I couldn't begin to tell you. I wouldn't. A know. quarter, third. It's possible. At some point in time during their relationship with us, ten percent, fifteen percent is possible. To be suspended, a WCW wrestler must test positive on three separate occasions. After an initial test, at the time their contracts are signed, wrestlers are tested randomly. But there's no guarantee a wrestler will be tested even once a year. Bischoff says six wrestlers have been suspended for abusing steroids in the last three years. From his heyday in the 80s, Hulk Hogan says he's down 70 pounds and now steroid free, but that some of his fellow wrestlers are not. I don't think it'll ever go away completely as long as there's a competitive nature in any type of physicality and there's a competitive edge to be gained. I think whether it's legal or illegal, some people will cross that line or step up to that line to gain that advantage. Most wrestlers say that whatever edge they do possess is the product of genetics and hard work. Until you're in the gym five days a week, two hours a day, watching your carbs, watching your protein year round for 15 years. After you do that, if you want to say I'm on steroids, then you can. But until you try that, don't say it. But when Buff Bagwell and his partner, Scott Steiner, display their muscles, many fans do say it. Despite the jeers, Big Papa Pump, as Steiner calls himself, takes immense pride in the physique he says he's developed naturally. I mean, look at that arm. Have you ever seen an arm like that before? Seriously, is that the largest arm in the world? If you have genetics and you train hard and you eat properly, I mean, you can pretty much get a decent enough physique uh, without it, or a good physique, or whatever. You know, I mean, steroids isn't the question anymore, really. You know, I mean, even if guys are using it, why should it matter? We don't perceive as well that the audience cares because they don't, in my view. Um, I think they care about illegal drug use, generally speaking. Uh, but I think law enforcement takes care of that. I think the courts take care of that. Uh, I'm not going to be the policeman of society much less the World Wrestling Federation. Night after night, in city after city, pro wrestlers put their bodies through a hellish ballet of abuse. When we continue, we'll see if this constant violence has led to the deaths of more than a few young men. This may not be a sport, but do any athletes in any sport work as hard as pro wrestlers? They have no off-season. In fact, the men and women who fly off of these turnbuckles and slam into the canvas do it, some of them, more than 200 nights a year, and each time in a different city. The toll exacted on their bodies can be frightening and deadly. Kelly Neal reports. The loose cannon, Brian Pillman! Brian Pillman, nicknamed the Loose Cannon and Flyin' Brian, was known for his flamboyance and high-flying kick. Handsome and athletic, he was a star in the WWF. But a year and a half ago, on the road in Bloomington, Minnesota, Pillman died in this motel room in his sleep. He was 35 years old. We told the bell 
ten times out of respect to the late Brian Pillman. The autopsy revealed that Pillman died of complications due to an enlarged heart. There were prescription drugs and cocaine found in his system. Cocaine also contributed to the death of 33-year-old wrestling star Eddie Gilbert four years ago. And last year, five days after his 27th birthday, Louis Mucciolo died. Friends say that night he mixed muscle relaxers with alcohol. Over the last six years, 11 active professional wrestlers at an average age of 36 have died. Most had performed in one of wrestling's top organizations at some point in their career. The equivalent to 13 players in the NFL dying during the course of a year, or six or seven in Major League Baseball, six in the NHL, maybe three in the NBA. It'd be like that. That's the equivalent in other sports. And I think if there were 13 guys dying every season, active players dying every season in the NFL, I think people would go, oh my God, there's a real problem here. Why are so many active wrestlers dying? One theory is some wrestlers abuse of prescription drugs, including painkillers, steroids, and human growth hormone. Those substances rarely show up in a coroner's report, so in many instances, there's no definitive cause of death. Family and friends are left to wonder if those wrestlers' dependence on prescription drugs to perform through injuries contributed to their death. Uh, Vince McMahon interviewed Brian Pillman's widow Melanie on his Monday night telecast, the night after her husband died. Is there anything that you would want to say to aspiring athletes who do get hurt and have to resort to prescribed medication, painkillers? I think all athletes, to a degree, um, experience a reliance on pain medicine. And, um, you know, I knew it was just a matter of time before um, it happened to someone. And um, fortunately, it, it was my husband. He uh, had this habit of um, going to all different pharmacies and having the doctors call different pharmacies as opposed to one because they would report him, you know. So there's probably about 30 or 40 in the Cincinnati area that he would go to to get his pain medicines because he didn't want anyone, um, you know, Walgreens or whatever, wherever he was going to think that he was a drug addict. Friends of Brian Pillman say that pro wrestling does not have a widespread abuse problem with prescription painkillers. I don't see anybody that has that problem right now, but uh, sooner or later it'll come up again. It always does. Do you believe that there's a problem with painkillers? I honestly don't feel that there's any more of a problem here than there is anywhere else. In any other segment of society or in any other sport? Any other sport. Louis Mucciolo, known to wrestling fans as Louis Spicoli, was with the WCW when he died last year. Friends say he was addicted to Soma, a muscle relaxer, and averaged up to 50 pills a night the last two and a half years of his life. That's more than 12 times the recommended daily dose. Soma is sold over the counter in Mexico. Mucciolo's sister Tina says her brother would make the two hour trip from his house in California to Tijuana to pick up supplies for himself and other wrestlers. How did you know that other wrestlers had placed orders with him? Um, she would say so, or, you know, I have to go to Tijuana before I leave to go on the plane tomorrow. So then I got to pick up for a friend before I go see the friend. A friend being another wrestler? Yeah. Rob Van Dam knew Mucciolo when they both wrestled for Extreme Championship Wrestling. He was a pallbearer at Mucciolo's funeral. Van Dam says he flushed his supply of Soma down the toilet when he learned of Mucciolo's death. I don't know if I was pushing towards death, if I was going to if I was going to be the next one to die. I mean, I, I can't say. It definitely definitely made me aware of of what track I was on, so that I could see clearly. I totally reevaluated everything in life. To me, just knowing that it may have saved one life is enough. Mucciolo's life was not saved by Brian Pillman's death four months earlier. Pillman's death from complications due to an enlarged heart was not necessarily caused by his abuse of prescription pain medications. There may have been another factor. Melanie Pillman says her husband had been injecting human growth hormone daily for a year and a half in order to increase his size and strength for wrestling. There's no question the growth hormone can enlarge the heart. And so we don't know, we can't absolutely say for sure why uh, this combination led to his death other than if you take all the elements, uh, it certainly would have to be considered as a contributory factor.
Receipts show that Pillman obtained human growth hormone, known as HGH, from the Palm Springs Life Extension Institute. Doctors at the Institute advocate use of the hormone to reverse the aging process. It's illegal to prescribe HGH unless it's for the treatment of a disease or medical condition. The Food and Drug Administration has seized the Institute's medical records and is conducting an ongoing investigation. Melanie Pillman says it was Hulk Hogan who told Brian he could obtain HGH from Dr. Edmund Chen at the Life Extension Institute. And a former wrestler who wished to remain anonymous says Hogan recommended Chen to many wrestlers. Through a spokesman, Hogan says he's never heard of Chen. And Chen says he does not prescribe the hormone to athletes and has never knowingly treated any wrestler. He refused further comment. I love you. Little Brian. <laughs> this is Brian Pillman's legacy. Little Brian was four years old when his father passed away. He talks about him sometimes. He'll say, remember when my old dad, flying Brian, and I went here or there? You know, and I'll try to reinforce those memories. Young Brian has a trophy case in his bedroom filled with his father's mementos. He wants to be a professional wrestler when he grows up. Melanie doesn't want that. She blames the wrestling lifestyle, in part, for her husband's death. I mean, I could sit here and name names of who it could have been, but it just was Brian Pillman. And sadly enough, and I don't want it to be anyone else. I don't want anyone else to have to go through what, what I went through. The only thing more base and primal than the circus of pro wrestling is the economic law that underscores its success. People, and a lot of them, are getting what they want. Unfortunately, the issues of drug abuse, or more importantly, the impact on kids of these violent and profane comedies, all of that will resonate only when enough fans take wrestling's own advice. Take your remote and hit the off button. For Outside the Lines, I'm Bob Lee. This has been a presentation of ESPN the worldwide leader in sports.